Well, please open your Bible at Isaiah chapter 53. We are resuming the series that we began before Easter, the gospel according to Isaiah. Now, this whole chapter is really a wonderful invitation to look at the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, what he has accomplished, and what he is able to do for each and every one of us who believe in him. And we know that this chapter is all about Jesus because in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, there's a story about a very distinguished man who was reading this book, this very chapter, Isaiah 53, as he was traveling in the desert uh, in his chariot. And God sent a believer by the name of Philip to help this man. And the man asked Philip, now, who is the prophet writing about? He's reading this chapter and he wants to know who it's about. And the scripture tells us that beginning with this chapter, that's Isaiah chapter 53, Philip explained the good news about Jesus. Good news. You know, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest good news for every person on the planet. And yet around the world, in every culture, and this has been true in every generation since the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the good news has been met overwhelmingly by unbelief. And that's where Isaiah begins in this chapter. Who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So the first thing that we need saving from is actually our own unbelief. That's where this remarkable chapter begins. And we saw earlier uh, what lies behind unbelief. We, we're distracted by the wrong considerations. We're drawn by the wrong priorities. We're driven by the wrong desires. And we saw that unbelief is a decision and it's actually a decision in which the mind and the heart and the will are all actively engaged. The mind makes a calculation. The heart gives direction and the will decides. And Isaiah tells us that the result of all this is overwhelming belief around the world. Verse three, he was despised and we esteemed him not. There's the world's verdict on Jesus. Now, we take it up today in verse four, and the plan is that God willing, we will look at verses four, five, six, and seven in this month of June, and then that we will come back to the remaining verses of this remarkable chapter in the fall. Now, I have to tell you that I come to the verses that are before us in these coming weeks with a sense of awe and a sense of trepidation. These are some of the best known and best loved words in all of the Bible. They take us to the heart of the greatest good news this world has ever heard. They give us the clearest statement of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. They show us what he's able to do for us today, and they point to the glorious future that lies ahead of everyone who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, for all eternity, we're going to be lost in wonder, love, and praise over what is described in these verses. So let me try and give to you a quick overview of what we'll be looking at over these next weeks. In verse four, where we begin today, we learn that Jesus bore the effects of sin. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, griefs and sorrows very obviously are the effects of sin, and Isaiah begins here because he wants to paint the big picture of what Jesus would accomplish at the cross. Through his death and resurrection, one day, all grief and all sorrow will be taken away. And so this verse really describes and points to a great restoration. Then in verse 5, 
we're going to see that Jesus bore the punishment of sin. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. So Jesus will bring about a great restoration. And the way in which he's going to do this is through substitution. Jesus stood in our place. That's the heart of this verse. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He bore the punishment, the chastisement that was due to us. So Jesus bore the effects of sin. Jesus bore the punishment of sin. And then in verse six, we see that Jesus bore sin itself. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, the word we're going to learn when we come to verse six is the word imputation, which very simply means to credit or to charge a person with something that really does not belong to him or to her. So, for example, if someone imputes a bad motive to you, well, that means that they are charging you with a motive that you did not have. They're putting this on you. They're counting this against you, even although the bad motive was not yours. Now, putting these three remarkable verses of Scripture together, we learn that Jesus purchased our restoration by substitution and imputation. And that is the heart of what Jesus accomplished at the cross. So there's an overview of where we're going over these next weeks. We're going to look at this marvelous restoration. We're going to see how it was accomplished through an amazing substitution and we're going to see that in that substitution, there was an unfathomable imputation so that sin and all its effects were dealt with for us by God in Jesus Christ at the cross. Now we begin today then at verse four, where we see that Jesus bore the effects of sin. Let's focus in on these remarkable words, surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now again, griefs and sorrows are the effects of sin in this world. Think about it. If Adam had not sinned, no one would ever grieve a loss. If Eve had not sinned, no one would ever have shed a tear. But the reality is that Adam and Eve did sin and that changed the world for them and it has changed the world for us. Sin cannot live in God's presence. So God drove our first parents out of the Garden of Eden, out of the paradise that they enjoyed. And once they were outside, there was no way for them to get back in. Our first parents found themselves in a harsher world. Adam experienced frustration in his work. Eve experienced pain in childbirth. Both of them grieved the loss of their firstborn son in a horrible act of violence. So I want us to see first from this remarkable verse of scripture that speaks so clearly into our world today that our world is filled with sorrow. And the scripture speaks to this, speaks right to us today. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And when Isaiah speaks about our griefs, our sorrows, he's describing the realities of life in our world. Our griefs, our sorrows, well, they 
involve all of the pain and the disappointment of life. Alec Mateer, who has written so helpfully on the book of Isaiah, puts it this way, we wish for more than we are able to achieve so that the good life is always eluding us. You know that feeling that you hope to get to a place where everything's just right and you never get there? There's always something that's coming up and spoiling it, keeping you from it. Now, the word that's translated here, griefs, can also be translated as infirmities. In other words, our griefs, our sorrows, include sicknesses, illnesses of every kind, We're talking here in the broadest possible terms of everything that blights our life in this world, all that puts the perfect life we all long for beyond our reach. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment about the griefs and the sorrows that we experience in this world. Our griefs, our sorrows. What are we talking about? Well, some griefs and sorrows are physical and everyone who lives with pain and is experiencing pain right now, you know how miserable this is. Pain in the joints, arthritis, migraines, fibroid myalgia. If you live with any of these or many more, you know the grief and sorrow of physical pain. Everyone who lives with sickness knows the pain that it brings. A diagnosis of cancer, Parkinson's disease, a heart condition, a stroke. And then on top of all of these things, there is the physical suffering that human beings impose on one another. The horrors of war in front of us every day the atrocities of human cruelty and abuse and violence. And then on top of all the physical suffering in this world that brings grief and sorrow, there are many more griefs and sorrows that are in the mind that relate to mental conditions. Anyone who has gone through depression knows the grief and the sorrow that that can bring. And beyond the physical and the mental, there is the grief and sorrow that is emotional. Anyone who knows what it is to live with the fear, the power of fear and of anxiety, uh, you know the grief and the sorrow that that brings. Anyone who lives with a deep sense of shame knows the same. And then, of course, there are some griefs, some losses that are just profoundly personal. Only you can know them. You lose a loved one. A husband, a wife, a treasured friend taken from you. There is a vast hole in your life that no one else can possibly fill. And then there are griefs and sorrows that are social. We live in this world of lies, deception, hatred, broken relationships, broken trust. If someone has lied to you, deceived you, you know the grief and sorrow that that brings. And then there are griefs and sorrows on top of all of these that are judicial. I mean, to be the victim of a crime is hard enough But if the crime is never brought to justice, then your pain is even greater. Here's one person who is wronged and he can't get justice. And here's another person who is wrongly accused and she can't get justice either. The world cries out, how long do we have to wait before we get justice? And then, of course, there are some griefs and sorrows that are spiritual. 
And if you know what it is to lose hope, you will know the grief that that brings. If you have ever felt that God himself is hiding his face from you, you will know what a grief and a sorrow that is. Now, think about this. The effects of grief and sorrow that come from the entrance of sin into the world. They go absolutely everywhere, physical, mental, emotional, personal, social, judicial, spiritual. They, they, they blight our lives in all of these dimensions. And when the scripture speaks about our griefs, our sorrows, God is speaking to the painful realities of our life in this world. Friends, we don't come to church to pretend that everything's okay. It's not. We don't come here for some exercise in wishful thinking. We don't come to hide from reality. We come to face reality. And it's right here in front of us as we open the scriptures together. If you know what it is to walk sorrow's path, if your heart is heavy, with inexpressible grief today, this verse is for you. God is speaking right into your sorrow. And we're opening the Bible to see what it is that he has to say. So our world is filled with sorrow. But here's the second thing that I want us to see from this remarkable text that points to Jesus that Jesus carried our sorrow. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, Isaiah has already spoken about grief and sorrow in verse three. If you look at it there, uh, he tells us that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But now you see, having said that in verse three, he's telling us why Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief here in verse four. The reason that Jesus was a man of sorrows is that he carried our sorrows. And the reason that he was acquainted with grief is that he bore our grief. In other words, Jesus took the weight of human grief and sorrow upon himself. And Isaiah uses two words to describe this. The first is the word born. He has borne our griefs, which literally means he lifted them up. Other translations say he took up our griefs, as if he bent down in order to pick them up. This was an intentional act on the part of Jesus. He came into the world to do this. He chose to take our griefs upon himself. And then Isaiah tells us that he carried our sorrows. In other words, he took the whole weight of human sorrow on his own shoulders. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, it means that Jesus has entered into every dimension of grief and sorrow in human life. And we identified seven dimensions. And Jesus Christ has entered into each and every one of them. Think about the physical sufferings of Jesus. Do you suffer physical pain? Jesus has been there prophesying what Jesus would actually experience. The psalmist in Psalm 22 says, all my bones are out of joint. Have you ever had one bone out of joint and felt the agony of that? On the cross, every bone in the body of Jesus pulled out of joint, not broken, but pulled out of joint. If you know what it is to suffer physical pain of any kind, the Lord Jesus Christ knows that grief and he has carried 
that sorrow? What about mental anguish? Do you suffer mental anguish? Jesus has been there. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said this, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Overwhelmed. If your mind has been troubled, the Lord Jesus Christ knows that grief and he has carried that sorrow. What about the emotional sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever been shamed, abused, hated by another person? Jesus has been there too. He was stripped of his robe and exposed to ridicule. He was mocked and he was taunted by people who hated him. If you have felt shame, Jesus knows that grief and he has carried that sorrow too. What about the personal loss that Jesus endured? Do you know what it is to feel alone, to feel abandoned, to feel left? Oh, Jesus has been there. One of his closest friends betrayed him and another of his closest friends denied ever knowing him. The rest, but well, they all forsook him and fled. If you know what it is like to feel abandoned and alone, Jesus knows that grief. He has carried that sorrow too. And then think about the social sorrows of Jesus. Have you known what it is to show love and patience and kindness that goes the extra mile towards another person and the whole of it is thrown back in your face. Uh, Jesus has been there. He came to his own and his own received him not. He said on one occasion, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing you were not willing. Oh, if your love, your patience, your kindness has been rejected, Jesus knows that grief. He has carried that sorrow too. And think of the judicial sorrows of Jesus. Have you suffered injustice? Well, Jesus has been there too. He was, think about this, physically attacked in a courtroom, the one place where a person ought to be absolutely safe and be able to present their case. He was sent from one trial to another with the charges being changed repeatedly along the way. He was condemned to death by a judge who had pronounced him innocent on three occasions. If you have ever suffered injustice, Jesus knows that grief. He's carried that sorrow too. And what about the spiritual sorrows of Jesus? Have you ever felt that God himself may have abandoned you? Well, if you've ever felt that Jesus has been there too. When our sins were laid on Jesus, God turned out the light. The sun stopped shining in the middle of the day. The whole land was plunged into darkness. And in that darkness, Jesus could no longer feel the comfort of his own father's love. He cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, if you have felt that the love of God was beyond what you could reach or feel, Jesus knows that grief. He has carried that sorrow too. Jesus could say in the words of Lamentations, look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow which was brought upon me.
which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Now, friends, here's what I want us to try and take in from all of this today. Jesus is God in the flesh and he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. I have been greatly blessed to not have suffered very much physical pain in my life at all. But a few years ago, I suffered back pain for about a year. And at the beginning of this year, one of my daughters-in-law suddenly uh, experienced very severe back pain. I'm sure it was much worse than mine because it required an emergency surgery. And thank God that has now given her relief. But I had a deep, deep feeling of empathy for her. Why? Because I knew something of what that was like. I had the deepest sense of connection to what she was experiencing because I knew it myself. Now, when you draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ, bring this to mind you are coming to a savior who knows what it is like. Whether we're talking about the physical pain that Jesus experienced, whether we're talking about the mental anguish, whether we're talking about the terrible abuse, the injustice that he suffered, Jesus Christ has suffered and not just a little. No, 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 it's not that he has suffered a little taste of what is in our lives. Jesus Christ has plumbed the depths of every dimension of human grief and of human suffering. He took it up and he has taken it all on his own shoulders and he knows what it is like at its very worst. When your heart is broken, when you think nobody can understand my pain, my grief, my sorrow, you can draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. And when you come to Jesus, you are coming to a loving Savior who knows what it is like. Our world is filled with grief and sorrow. That's why this verse speaks so powerfully and directly to us today. Our Lord Jesus Christ has carried our grief and our sorrow, and that is why he is the savior that we need. And then here's the last thing today that is so very wonderful. Jesus promises a world where sorrow will be no more. Now, the words of our verse, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4, are quoted in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17. And Matthew tells us there that at evening, they brought to him, that is to Jesus, many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was, Matthew says, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. And we saw earlier that the words translated griefs and sorrows include all of our illnesses and all of our diseases. Now, this raises a very obvious and a very important and even wonderful question. Why does Matthew say that Jesus fulfilled these words of Isaiah in his life, in the healing miracles, 
when Isaiah very, very clearly is pointing to Jesus bearing our griefs and our sorrows in his death. And the answer to that question surely is this, that Matthew is telling us that what happened to these people who were so wonderfully healed by the Lord Jesus Christ during his ministry on earth, that their experience was a kind of taste, a kind of sample of what one day every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ will enjoy. What we have in the Gospels and in the wonderful healing miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ is a little glimpse of the big picture of why Jesus Christ came into the world. Here's a sample of what one day he will bring to completion. Every demon cast out, every sickness healed. And this is what Isaiah prophesied. Why did Jesus come into the world? Well, that's about the most important question you could ask. Why did Jesus go to the cross? And you can answer that question in so many ways. You might say, well, Jesus went to the cross so that we could be forgiven. That's true, but why? You might say, Jesus came into the world so that we could be born again. That's true, but why? Oh, Jesus came so that we could live lives of love and of service in this world. Yes, that's true, but why? Jesus came into the world and died on the cross to fulfill the great ultimate purpose of God, which is to bring us into a glorious new world where grief and sorrow will be no more. And Isaiah is a master teacher. And before he takes us further into what happened at the cross, he's giving us the why. He's giving us the big picture. What was all this about? It was about a great restoration that Jesus Christ came into the world to bring about and one day will bring to completion when he returns in power and in glory to reverse all the effects of sin and to bring us into a glorious world where grief and sorrow will be no more. Jesus tells us that we will go through a time of sorrow. We will experience sorrow in this world. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep. Not a question, not an if. You will weep. You will lament. You will be sorrowful. But thank God he doesn't end there. But your sorrow will turn into joy. And later Jesus adds, you will rejoice and no one will ever take your joy from you. This joy will be ours, Jesus says, when he comes again in power and in glory. He's going to bring us, brothers and sisters, into a new world where there's going to be no more war, no more violence, no more hatred, lies, deception, no more migraines, no more cancer, no more chemo, no more depression, no more fear, no more anxiety, no more temptations, no more sin, no more hunger, no more thirst, no more doubt, no more pain, no more wounds, no more sorrow, no more grief and no more loss. God himself will be with us as our God. He's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. 
for the former things have passed away. Christian brother, sister, one day you will have shed your last tear because there will be no grief, no sorrow in the presence of Jesus in heaven. The more you know about grief and sorrow in your life, the more interest you should have in Jesus. He went to the cross so that grief and sorrow should never have the last word, so that there should be a great restoration, so that we would be brought one day in his kindness into a world that is freed from all of the ugly and horrible effects of sin, a world of love, a world of peace, a world of joy, a world in which grief and sorrow are no more. And Jesus offers a place in that glorious world to every person who will follow him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the glorious hope that is ours because your son became our savior and took up our griefs and carried our sorrows. Grant that in this world of pain, we may know his help and grant that we may live in the hope and joyful anticipation of all that he has purchased for us at the cross, for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.